We want to read a uh, quick scripture. And this morning, I, I just want to say quickly that this message, I had a message prepared for, for today during the week, and then all of a sudden, my heart, something changed in my heart, and I came about with something else that I want to share with you today. And it's a tough message, but when Brother Deli read today's scripture and then repeated Galatians 5, 20 uh, and 23, I said, all right, I've got it, because that's the message I'm preaching on today. Romans 8, 19 to 23. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. I want to repeat that. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is kind of tough scripture, but the Holy Spirit is going to help us to understand a little bit what, what he's talking about. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I want you to read that with me. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Remember what this first verse said? The creation earnestly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. Father, we thank you today for your wonderful presence. We thank you for your people, God. We thank you for the test that the challenge the enemy posed. And God, that your people triumphed. That we worshipped you. That we ministered unto you despite. Because of the love that the Spirit of God put in our hearts for our God. We thank you for that manifest presence that is here today. And so Lord, we ask you today, Holy Spirit. To touch our minds. To stir our spiritual understanding. To open the eyes of our hearts. That we may grasp what you are saying to us and anoint your servant. That the message from heaven, as intended in this scripture, will flow and will enter the hearts and the lives of God's people from pulpit to pew. And bring in us the transformation that you desire. Grant to us, O oh God, a transformation. That we will recognize, O oh God. How important we are to this world in which we live. And will seek to fulfill our role. And accomplish our destiny. In Jesus name. Amen. Praise God. You may take your seats. Are we releasing children today? Don't have too many. I'll keep them. Making an executive call. Like the president. But keeping them. Praise God. Waiting for the sons is what I want to talk about. And when we say the sons, the Bible says, now are we the sons of God? It speaks to all of us. Sons, daughters, it doesn't matter. Just like when we say man, it refers to everybody. God made Adam. Adam was really man, meaning male and female. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. What is the apostle talking about here? What is the Spirit of God leading him to speak about when he's talking about all this confusing, seemingly confusing issues in the book of Romans? The creation awaits the revealing of the sons of God. He's taking us all the way back to the Garden of Eden and what transpired there. 
But what transpired there was something very, very tragic. When God made Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden. And he gave Adam and Eve power and authority. He gave them the authority to rule, to be king and queen over the universe. Read the creation narrative and the mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve. I give you power to rule, to subdue. To have dominion over all creation. There were supreme king and queen over God's creation. Land, animals, forest, everything. They were given the power to subdue, to rule, to control, to have dominion. It means it was their dominion. They were to have control. When Adam decided to disobey God, something terrible happened. Something tragic happened. It wasn't just that Adam and Eve fell, but the tragedy was they took all of creation with them. When you are in a war, the opposing armies try to capture the commander or the king of the next army. In those days, the kings went out to battle. Not like these days where commanders and generals go out and the kings sit in their throne or pentagon or wherever. But those kings led their armies. They went out leading their armies. And each army tried to capture the king. So the king was always protected. Because once they capture the king, the battle was over. They can't fight without the king. You take the king, checkmate. That's it. Battle over. Adam was the king. And Satan knew if he got him, he got it all. And so when Adam sinned as the federal head, of all creation, he took everything down with him. Paul sums it up this way, in Adam all die. Not some die, not humans die, all die. In Adam all died. When Adam fell, everything fell with him. The environment fell, the ozone layer fell. The ground fell. Everything began to groan. Why do you groan? You groan when you are in pain. This is what he's saying here. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. Wasn't the animal's fault? They didn't fall into the situation because of their own doing, not willingly. The animals didn't do it. The trees didn't do it. The fish of the sea did not disobey. Adam did. So creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because of Adam's error. And the whole creation groans, awaiting. King James Version says, all creation groan awaiting the redemption or the manifestation of the sons of God. Everything went into a state of pain. You groan when you're in pain. All creation began to groan. Not just man, but everything fell. The king was taken, checkmate, and all fell with him. Willingly or not, they're all held in bondage. This groaning, when we look at this word, there are two words there that in the King James says, creation groans awaiting their redemption. And in verse 20 says, creation was subjected to futility. The groaning has to do with the futility. 
And let me show you what these words mean. The word grow, as Paul used here, is a Greek word which means cannot express or inexpressible. It is pain that they cannot verbalize. The pain when they saw Adam fall and the consequence of what happened, it's, it's, it was so terrible a pain that they could not even express. You know, people are in so much pain they can't even explain. They can't verbalize. It's just they respond in groans. And this is the state of creation when Adam lost his crown on that day. The ground began to groan. God said to Adam, from now on, even the ground will resist you. You, will, you must toil now from the sweat of your brow in order to get sustenance from the earth. The animals began to groan. Everywhere there was a sound heard in the spiritual universe as creation began to groan, seeing the king being taken captive. And this groaning is connected to the pain. And what was the pain? The pain was an existential despair. The pain was now as a result of a sense of purposelessness. That's the meaning of this word, futility. When he says the creation was subjected to futility, that word futility is the Greek used there, which means emptiness or purposelessness. This is what caused all of creation to groan. Well, what are we going to do now? The reason for which we were made has now been frustrated. The reason why we were created has now been frustrated. So why do we exist? What is now of a purpose? We are purposeless now. And this is why creation is groaning today. This is why there is so much strife and conflict in the world. It's a sense of purposelessness. It's resulting from that sense of despair, of meaninglessness. All the fightings and all the stuff happening in France and all around the world is the result of the groaning which comes from futility, from not having a purpose, understanding what we are supposed to do. What is life all about? A poll taken recently in universities among university students, and over 70% of them say there is no purpose to life. We are born, we go to school, we get married, we have a few children, we die. There is nothing beyond that. A sense of despair. And every day, people are groaning. What we are seeing, all the crime and the evil, is the agitation, it's, it's the result of a sense of purposelessness. People crawling in the dark, not knowing why we exist. The futility, creation, subject to that futility. The groaning is coming from the inside. They don't even know when people are groaning in pain. They don't, most of them don't even know what's causing it. They may groan and say, I have a pain in my belly. But they don't know what's causing that pain. It may be hunger. It may be ulcer. It may be something deeper that is causing it and until they go to a doctor they may explain a symptom and the doctors will try to analyze and get with all the x-rays and everything else to analyze see what's causing it what's behind it and so people are in groaning they are groaning they're holding their stomach they're holding their hearts there and groaning they don't know what is causing it sense of despair, a sense of emptiness, 
a sense of purposelessness. God made Adam and God made animals and God made trees and God put this whole thing in an ecosystem. And then the head falls. The rest now say, well, what is our purpose now? When captivity, the original intent for creation has been destroyed. What is our purpose? And the groaning is coming from a sense of purposelessness. When children, youth are on the internet and are hooking into ISIS and deciding to leave the comforts of their homes to travel across to fight to the death for whatever purpose, it is all a response to the sense of darkness and meaninglessness in their lives. So what is the solution to this? It's a reversal. If the head is lost, if the head is taken captive, that brings all of creation, subjects all of creation to futility. To fix the problem, God has to simply reverse that. And that is why Paul, in the same book of Romans, says, by one man's sin, or one man's disobedience, all of us fell into sin and suffering and groaning and futility. So by the obedience of one man, many are restored. This is why Paul calls Jesus the second Adam. This first Adam lost his crown and plunged us. The second Adam came to restore. That's redemption. That's salvation. It's a simple plan. By one man's sin, many are made sinners. By one man's obedience, many are made righteous. When people ask you today, why do you think as Christians you have the way to God and all the religions of the world are false and they're worshiping demons? You understand there's a reason. We are not saying that we are the way to God because we just feel that way. There is a principle. There is a pattern. There's a plan and a purpose. God is strategic. And this is what Paul is explaining to us. This is why there's no salvation apart from Christ. He is the second Adam. He is the one who reversed the problem of the first Adam. And if the first Adam plunged us into darkness and alienation and pain and suffering, for God to reverse that, another man must come and undo the error of that first Adam. This is the reason for the incarnation of the Son of God. One man took us down, a man must bring us back. But all men are sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how are we going to get a man to bring us back? See the beauty and the wisdom of God. Jesus said, I am going to go down, make me a man. Let me be the second Adam. I'll take the rematch. And that's what redemption is. Jesus coming to earth is a rematch. You know, you have two boxers fighting and one is beaten and then they call for a rematch. This is the rematch. The second Adam. Coming to take him on. And you and I don't, we can't fathom what is involved there. That a son of God who is eternal saying, Father, I'm going to take him on for the sake of humanity to recover your lost heritage. The father turns to him and said, do you know what you're asking me? To suspend your powers as God to be make, made like unto a man? If you sin once, you're done. You can never be God again. The world is lost forever because there's nobody else who could, who could go. And Jesus said, Prepare me a body. Understand the love of God. 
You understand the love of God? That a son of God left his glory to be made like unto a man. One sin would have brought him into the same era as the first Adam and forever forfeited his divinity. We can't fathom this. But if there's one takeaway from it, it's oh, how he loves us. So the restoration. Depends on us. The manifestation of the sons of God. This is what they're waiting on. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation is begging. Creation is crying out. The earth, the whales, the ecology, the ozone, everywhere, all are groaning, crying. What are they waiting for? They are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Because if you and I are be made like unto God again, if we are restored, everything will come back into order. Everything is saved as a result of the revelation of the sons of God. The more we conform to our image, to the image of God, the better we treat everything around us. The little doggy in our house is blessed because we are Christians. And the deeper we are revealed as the sons of God. The more we draw into Christ, the more the dog is saved. You know what I'm saying? We're passing, my wife and I walk in the street one day, and there's a big crowd of people watch, stopping. They're looking across the street because a boy must have been on drugs, or I don't know what it is. He is mercilessly beating his dog. And everyone is stopping and, 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 and shouting and saying, what are you doing? And he's swearing and cursing at everybody and telling them, mind your own business. So everything around us gets treated according to the revelation of who we are. The more we draw to God, the more we are restored to the image of God, the more excited creation gets and becomes because when the sons of God are revealed, creation says they will not abuse us. They will not. I have this personal thing happening into my life, and I know I'm experiencing what Paul is talking about. If I'm in a parking lot and I have a candy and I drop the wrapper, the Holy Spirit says, pick it up. And I find this refinement of character. We may call it refinement of character. But it's a, re a movement back into the image of God. God created us in his image and likeness. That image was tarnished when we fell. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is sanctifies to restore the image. And as we are restored and brought back to that place where God originally made us, with that original intent, we will again take care. Of everything around us. So all creation is groaning. Waiting for our revelation. Because if we all revert. And we all come back to that place. Of being the sons of God. We will not destroy the ozone. We will not destroy the environment. The greed in the hearts of man. That is wrecking the world. Will not exist. It all has, it is all wrapped up in the revelation of the sons of God. In other words, creation is crying. 
crying out, please, 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 please come back to God. 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 And even when we become Christians, it is saying their creation is still groaning and saying, please, please, it's not finished the conversion. Please continue to grow in grace. Grow in grace. Grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. For as we grow in grace and knowledge of God, we are moving into eternal life. We are realizing eternal life. This is eternal life that you know God and Jesus Christ, the one who he sent. He sent. Getting that intimate, intimate knowledge of God as we move into God. The more we grow into God, the more we are realizing eternal life. And the more we realize eternal life, the more we behave like God. And so creation is begging for a revelation of the sons of God. But who are the sons of God? Who are the sons of God? We read it. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So not every Christian is a son of God. Every Christian is a child of God. But not everyone is a son of God. Hebrews chapter 12 distinguishes between children and sons. Whom the father loves, the children he chastises. But sons, he scourges. There's a difference. And most Christians at conversion, most Christians in the church start to say, we are still children. Children. Children throw tantrums. Children want to play games. And Jesus says, that's what most of the church is. That John the Baptist came and he preached. And I have come and I'm preaching. And he says, but to the people. He said, you're saying that we are blowing our pipes and playing our harps and you're not dancing. Jesus said that. John the Baptist came. He didn't dance to your tune. And I have come. And you're accusing me of drinking with wine with the drunkards and being with the prostitutes. That this is not a game. The children in the marketplace would play their flute and they would mimic games of weddings and funerals. And he says, we, Jesus said, we are not here to dance to anybody's tune. We're here with the program of God. And much of the church is still at the stage of infancy and childhood. We want new things. Children always want something new to keep them entertained. And that's what a church is. Entertain us. Bring something new every time to keep us, keep our interest level. It's not talking about creation is not waiting for conversion. Creation is not waiting for children. When you're converted, you're a baby. When you're born again, you're a baby. And that baby grows to, to infancy and, and adolescence and then to sonship. Creation is now waiting for the babies and the converts and those throwing tantrums. Creation is waiting for the manifestation, for the revealing, for the coming out of the sons of the living God. Children don't make a difference to our world. It is their sons. Who are the sons? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. 
out of sons of God. This is the reason. Read, read, read the New Testament. Read the epistles. Paul, Peter, and Jude, and James. Walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Sing in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. It is calling for life in the Spirit. Because they that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And that's what creation is waiting for. Not babies, not children, but the sons. But the church is lacking the sons. The church of Jesus Christ is missing sons full of children. Here today, not here tomorrow, to today, somebody says something, they're offended. Those can't change the world. That's not what creation wants. Be led by the Spirit. How are you going to be led by the Spirit? Without being filled with the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit when we are filled with the Spirit. To be led by the Spirit means, imagine you hold a dog on a leash and you are leading that dog. Is the Spirit leading us? Is the Spirit controlling us? Those who are full of the Holy Ghost are led by the Spirit. But how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? Unless we are prepared to travail before God. It comes down to the same thing every time. Unless we are prepared to spend time in the presence of God. And be filled with his spirit. The spirit cannot lead us. Sons are led by the spirit. Are controlled by the spirit. To lead someone means you're giving direction. You are controlling their destiny. It is not them getting up in the morning and saying, I'll do this, I'll do that. But what God is leading me to do. I am led by the Spirit. When you are led by the Spirit, you will be able to say, we will be able to say like Jesus, the words that I speak are not mine, but the words that I have received of the Father. When we are led by the Spirit, we will be able to say like to Jesus, the works that I do are authorized by my Father. Is that what he said? Jesus said, none of the words I speak are mine. They're from my Father. John chapter 14, 15, 16, read. The works that I do are not my own. I'm just doing what I saw the Father doing. How did he see? How did he hear? It's not with the intellect, but it's living in the fullness of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is leading him, guiding him. And so, it comes down to simple logic. We are not prepared to spend time and cultivate a life in the Spirit to be filled with the Spirit. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit. That tense is continuous. It's not, I got filled 20 years ago, spoke in tongues, and that's it. No, you don't drive your car into the gas station, fill up the tank, and drive from here to New York and drive all over the world without ever going back into the gas station. We get filled with the Spirit. We work, we praise God, we serve, and we are burning. We need to be refilled constantly. Those that are filled with the Spirit are led by the Spirit, and they are the sons of God, and this is what creation is looking for. For, for the revelation of the sons of God to ease, to alleviate the groaning and to bring them out of that place from existential despair. Those people who are abusing animals, I see people posting on Facebook about all kind of activists coming on behalf of 
animals that are being abused. And I said, you know, I am saying to myself, it's all good that you have activists for this and activists for that, but a real solution to the abuse of the animal, to the abuse of the, he, 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 there's much talk today about all the climate change, the, the Pope and everybody all is about climate change. He's not waiting for a legislation from the G20. He's waiting. Creation is now waiting on Obama, and creation is now waiting on the Pope. Creation is waiting on you and me to be revealed. What the world offers and what all the G20 and all the people's summits will offer are just band-aid solutions. Creation is now waiting for them. They will accept the band-aid solution, the topical solutions for now. But what they're waiting for is the revelation of the sons of God. They're waiting on you and me to stop playing games, stop being children, and move into a life of the Spirit to be led by the Spirit. Will you remain in hiding or will you come out and be revealed as a son of God? That's for you, friends. 